Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're delighted to see a full room today for continuity and innovation. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is the result of a conversation that started uh, around about a year ago with my friends and partners from University of Nottingham, Tim Collett, Katerina Borzi, and Nick Haynes. And I'd like to thank them for their efforts in initiating this and uh, um, helping to make this a, a very exciting lineup. And I'd also like to thank our uh, public program team, Manije Verghese and Harriet Jennings and their team uh, for making this possible. Uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to get the kind of support from both institutions to collaborate together and to put something like this forward as part of a wider reconsideration of what ought to be at the center of both practice and teaching and architecture. So this idea of continuity and innovation, it, it's a very old idea, of course. Um, if we, particularly if we begin to link this up with an idea that um, there's a spatial continuity between the home, the room, the city. Uh, back in when Serdal wrote uh, uh, about a new uh, idea of urbanism, it was based on the idea that there could be a kind of continuity in reasoning between the, the home, the room, and the city, something that is echoed uh, today, again, in the work of Stephen Bates, who will be uh, finishing the morning's conversation. But all along the way, we uh, keep on forgetting and then returning to this idea that there's both spatial and temporal continuity that must be at the heart of our discipline. Um, sometimes we forget it and have to be reminded, as uh, Rossi did when he uh, opened up his arguments for architecture in the city with uh, a reflection on the Palazzo Ragioni. Recently, I was thinking about the, the role of the Cathedral Notre Dame in Paris and thinking about uh, uh, Richard Sennett's argument that what had happened in the 13th century in, in Paris was that this magnificent new edifice emerged within the city and became part of a reconsideration of the ethics of welcoming strangers into the city, new kinds of practices of gardening, of the work of the almoners, uh, new sorts of ideas about how you listen to someone in confession. And all of these things clustered around the cathedral and transformed, in a sense, the life of the Ile Saint Louis and the uh, banks of the Seine. Now, in many respects, that reminds us that behind the question of continuity is always one of a, a kind of ongoing innovation in human practice that draws our material culture into collaborative themes, collaborative practices around material, a material culture. And one of the things that we as architects always have to do is to think not only how things are made, how they're built, how they're taken apart, how they're repurposed, but also the way in which we inhabit spaces, adapt them, adapt to them. And so our great buildings are always both a kind of setting and incitement to both continuity and to innovation. And one of the things that I, I think has happened recently is that we've become sort of re-enthused uh, about the importance of uh, an attention to material continuity. One of the things that has come about partly because of questions of the climate crisis has been that we are forced to ask the question um, about how we might reuse, adapt, repurpose the buildings that which make up our surroundings, modify not only buildings, but pieces of the city. And this has created a kind of, I guess, a new, uh, a new spirit of thinking about the importance of how we consider uh, the, in a way, the inner being of our buildings. We start to look for their character and qualities in ways that are perhaps a little bit more uh, enthusiastic about investigating them with true curiosity. 
Now, uh, a few years ago, it's less than 10 years ago, inside housing and urbanism, we, we had a student propose that they would think about reusing office buildings for dwellings. And sort of the advice at the time was, oh, nobody would do that. It's too expensive. And, um, and so we, we had, for a brief while, discouraged the student. And then after a while, we kind of remembered, actually, you know, we should be raising this question a little bit more ambitiously. And so the, the thesis sort of turned into a kind of exploration. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? And in these last 10 years, the field has changed dramatically. And now none of us would have offered that advice. And we've now started a part of the program uh, led by my colleague, Steve Sinclair, where Steve Sinclair, Ellen of Pascolo are taking one of our briefs and putting it uh, focused directly on the question of adaptive reuse. But not just from the point of view of how buildings might be taken apart, thought about, adapted, adding new, uh, adding new structure, adding new material, thinking about the, the, uh, the sort of synergies between new and old, but looking at it also in a wider context, that of the city. And so I think that one of the things that has happened in these last 10 years is that it has become a more focused area of consideration within education and research and certainly in practice. And all of the, in a way, the most exciting things that are being learned these days are being learned in practice. And they're being learned practically as the architects in our field find themselves confronted with the challenge of reusing buildings that have started to deteriorate, whose particular qualities are not fully known until you start taking them apart, and discovering that the way in which we contract uh, the, the, the uh, reconstruction of them often is less than fit for purpose to the challenges of the, uh, of the work to be done. And so it's for this reason that in a school of architecture, we've invited practicing architects, all of whom have been thinking very closely about questions of continuity, repurposing, adaptation, and brought them together so that we might think about the lessons from their work that we can begin to incorporate into, our, uh, into education. We are delighted this morning in this morning's session to have with us Simon Henley of Henley Hale Brown, Stephen Taylor of Stephen Taylor Architects, and then Stephen Bates. And we will be hearing something of their reflections on projects. And then we'll have an opportunity for a discussion panel where we'll be joined by our colleague Irene Scalbert from Housing and Urbanism and the AA, and Anne Fehrenbach from uh, Stanton Williams. And we'll have a discussion on the lessons to be learned for education from these kinds of projects. One of the things that I think is important about this group is that every single one of these people are engaged not only in practice, but in education. And that's why it becomes a particularly wonderful opportunity to think about where the field is going and how we start to move from the idea that students need to be taught always to design as though they are the originators of something new and never before seen, and instead start to realize that some of the greatest interest is in the modification of the existing. So we will begin now with uh, Simon Henley, who will give us our first presentation. And he will be partnered with his collaborating colleague, Stephen Taylor. Uh, after about 15 minutes, they're going to present some of their work in common, as well as some of their work independently. Simon, please join us. Lawrence, thank you. Good morning. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes, then Steve is going to do the similar thing, talking about our own work. And then, rarely, I think we've, we, uh, we've had an opportunity to collaborate together, so we want to talk about a project that we've been working on. Um, what I'd like to do is talk about, actually, the, uh, the origins of the practice and the way in which, quite quickly, the adaptive reuse of buildings seems to have, in a way, given us our, our logic, our reasoning by which we approach buildings. Um, 
And uh, th there's two things in, in the title. I talked about association and attunement. Um, social uh, uh, association, the, the way in which buildings, less as objects, but more as space-shaping elements, um, play a role, as it were, in the city for human beings. Um, and, and attunement, something which I think we're acutely, more acutely aware of than ever before, the attunement to the environment, to climate, to time, to seasons, to weather, um, to the other species. Um, and, and this sense that, I guess it's the opposite to me of the engineered approach to sustainability. And this is a sort of a, a really easy lesson to learn visiting um, the cave uh, the Anastasi uh, cliff dwellings of uh, the Midwest America and that the way in which they understood really clearly uh, the seasonal use of a shaded space uh, in the summer and how that then became a warm <coughs> space in winter. And then this uh, project in Cuba, Las Terrazas, which is a sort of 1960s, 1970s new village. And it's, it's a very, uh, there's one unit, one house type that makes the whole project. But what makes the project is these kinds of spaces where four dwellings share a staircase uh, and you know, in this climate, this kind of intense evidence of domesticity of that attunement to climate um, and the association you have with your fellow uh, residents. Um, so this, uh, so, so early on, we, we started, you know, we were making adaptive reuse projects, a big warehouse, um, and, and using analogy to come up with a narrative of, of reuse. The idea, perhaps, that a settlement is built on the roof. And then, with Talkback, this inert space becomes uh, a, a, a kind of multi-story cloister, a, a garden, um, and... and and where people worked, the idea was that people would associate that with a garden, with outside space, rather than, uh, as it were, the interiors. And, and so I suppose two things become really clear at this point for me in terms of our practice is the way in which typology uh, was sort of latent in existing things, the capacity to recognise that it had the, the, the potential to be something else, and that often seems to form a strong connection between, let's say, typology and social relations, association. But also, um, the, the wall. It's the wall, and you can use that term very loosely because what I guess I'm talking about is a threshold between inside and outside space, which might be anything from half a metre to a few metres, may take the, ne the form of a wall or may take something greater like a kind of... In an inhabited loggia, um, is, is the primary element which relates everything that happens inside a building to, to outside the building. And in the context of working with the existing building, that was where we had the kind of the, the, the capacity. And so this led to, I, I guess, in, in the context of patterns of living, this is a co-housing scheme where the notion that there was a ambition for an intentional community. So this becomes a cluster of homes around a courtyard um, and underneath which is a hall and in which ritual happened. And there's that ebb and flow between the centrality of communal living and the kind of perimeter of shared but, shared but um, distinct gardens, not um, uh, owned by anybody. Um, and then this idea of landscape in uh, our work in Chadwick, for Chadwick Hall for the University of Roehampton, where we encountered an 18th century landscape co-opted in the mid 20th century to make um, a large uh, housing scheme, the Autumn West Estate, into which we were then to bring some uh, student homes. And in the context of this 18th century listed home, which, um, in the 20th century had had um, sort of an extensions of garden walls and garden buildings placed into it. And so the landscape becomes the structure by which 
um, the, the pattern or the, 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 the plan for these 230 people to live together around courtyards and terraces, all of which stems from the structure of the building, the structure of the walls, the structure of the landscapes, including kind of field boundaries and so on. And, and so this structure um, creates these uh, spaces of association. Um, but then the wall, there was this, I guess, a frustration about the way in which we now build and, and the, the, the thermal breaking walls making it so difficult, as it were, to build with some clarity. So what we started to explore here, and, and one therefore starts to see links tracing back over 10, 20, almost 30 years. So here we are making um, load-bearing uh, brick and concrete walls, in effect, kind of ruins around modern structures. And they become where there's a capacity in certain kind of buildings to have collective experience. To a certain extent, the landscape creates the kind of um, backdrop for that. But there's the, the, um, there's the other, which is the common experience, the, the common experience, but maybe alone. And so this thick wall of about one and a half meters in, in, in kind of conventional language, as far as the client's concerned, balconies and windows, but that space becomes a kind of third space between uh, inside and out. And then kind of coming very much to the present, th this, this, again, this kind of role of typology and the, and the nature of the threshold explored in these two sort of twin sibling housing schemes, which are in Hackney. Um, this is uh, an aerial photograph after the buildings are completed. Um, I'm not going to point. Um, but, but due to um, war, uh, you know, um, bomb damage, this whole area was redeveloped. But what you're seeing then is, in that previous photograph, a kind of 20th century piece of city immersed in a 19th century bit of city. And, and so our project uh, deals with that, particularly the bottom left-hand one, this uh, being on the kind of um, the seam between two versions of the city. And I don't know how far I'm stretching this question of adaptive reuse, but I guess, you know, what I'm trying to tie together here in some way, shape, or form is, is the role that adaptive reuse has conti and continues to play in our methodologies of conceiving of buildings and thinking about how they're constructed uh, and how that plays out then in, in, in sort of new patterns of, of living. And that, for us, is a kind of fertile territory linked in with the sort of palpable role of, of, of uh, sustainability, i.e. how we really understand and experience the environment. So these buildings are, in a way, just uh, the two things. They're masonry monolithic interiors placed adjacent to concrete frames uh, which are to be occupied you know, outside. They're, again, they're basically, they are, their reality on paper is their circulation and their balconies. But what they are, in a sense, is types of construction that lend themselves to natural um, and, and, uh, and, and absolutely necessary uh, experience and sensation being inside, being outside. So there's a kind of parity ingrained in this project, parity between those two conditions. And then there's this kind of dialogue between the 19th century city, so this is a series of villas, and the 20th century city and the way this building relates to the, the wider estate. And so it plays out in these, in these loges which are orientated towards the landscape. So th this is parkland but it's accidental parkland. Um, this parkland, you know, the, um, the buildings don't attend to it. They don't uh, orientate themselves to it. And so in this, uh, in this design, that's, that it's, that's what we were seeking to do, to, in a sense, to use the monolithic masonry buildings to relate to the 19th century city and the uh, framed structures 
to relate to the 20th century estate, but orientate to the landscape. And in orientating the landscape, obviously there's the visceral experience of the landscape, but there's also the attunement to the environment. So it's kind of two versions, it's two versions of the city, but it's also fundamentally two ways of seeing the world as um, a, a cosmopolitan environment and uh, a natural world. And then in the second building, the loggia plays a slightly different role, but, but you know, maybe in a more straightforward way, in a slightly more urban context, it's um, mediating between the private realm of home and the public uh, nature of the city. So we, where the first one, we kind of co-opted the idea of villas, this is uh, a palazzo. And um, these last few slides really just show the, the character and nature of that loggia and its relationship in mediating between, as it were, the, the inner fabric of the homes and the wider context of the city. And how this is, I guess, social, uh, environmental, and constructional, and it's all happening in this kind of deep, thick, whether it's a wall or a loggia in these projects. Thank you.